Good evening. Once again, it's good to be able to, to be with you tonight, to be able to open up the Word of God and to study from it. And I mentioned, meant to mention last evening, uh, but I appreciate the, the songs that have been led thus far, as uh, many of them have been uh, tied to the, the things that we're studying, and the two that we sing tonight are uh, in, in line with the, the things that I hope to be discussing this evening. Uh, but as we were singing this last song, I was thinking about that last verse, in fellowship suite, we can uh, sit at his feet. What a blessing that will be when we get to uh, dwell forever with the Lord. And we look forward to that night. And uh, we look forward to the time when we can all join together at the, in the presence of God and, and dwell with him uh, forever. Uh, but if you have the, the heavenly library with you tonight, if you open to Genesis chapter 32, Genesis chapter 32. As we read through the Bible, sometimes we come across these stories that are there, and sometimes they kind of get you scratching your head, and you kind of think, why in the world is that there? What in the world is God trying to tell us with this story? It kind of, sometimes it seems like it's some kind of place marker, that God is just giving us this, and uh, we just kind of read it and, and wonder, it, is that really a value to us, or is it just kind of a, a side detail here? Uh, but as we mentioned yesterday, God doesn't instruct us except He's trying to teach us something, and I think as, as we find stories such as this in Genesis chapter 32, there's something God is teaching us here, and I want to spend some time considering this story of Jacob as he wrestles all night long, and he eventually ends up with a blessing and a new name. And so while, again, it may seem like some random chance encounter, I think there's a valuable point of development here, or a necessary point of development in the life of Jacob, and there's a lesson for us to learn as we study this, this story and then a story of a, another character throughout the Old Testament. I think we're familiar with Jacob. Uh, Jacob's a very common uh, one of the patriarchs, he's one of, a very common person described throughout the Old Testament. As you go throughout the, the latter part of the Old Testament, God describes himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so Jacob is one of the central parts of the Bible story. And his mad name means supplanter or one to take by the heel. And I think as you, you study the story, that, that's quite appropriate because Jacob literally does that in the womb as he grabs onto Esau's heel in his mother's womb. And yet throughout the, the life of Jacob, we see that going on to be his character, that idea of supplanting as he's constantly scheming for advantage. And there, there's a couple of things that we know specifically that Jacob does. He, he takes advantage of Esau to get his birthright for just a pot of, just, or a pot of stew. And his brother comes in and he's just starving. And he says, you know what? I, I'm about to die. And Jacob says, well, I've got a pot of stew here if you want to give me your birthright. Now, I don't know that he was literally about to die, but I think Jacob takes advantage of his brother in this case and ends up with the birthright. Then a little while later, when Jake Isaac goes to bless the brothers and his son, he intends to bless Esau, and yet Jacob deceives his father so that he can receive the blessing. And you see that's kind of the way that Jacob operates. He's scheming and and conniving so that he can gain advantage over another. And so Jacob, taking the blessing of Esau, as we remember, causes Esau to be angry, and Esau wants to kill Jacob. And so Rebekah, she was kind of there with him in, in that whole deceiving of, of Isaac, and so she says, well, I've, I've got a problem on my hand here. Let me uh, send him to my family's house so he can find a wife for himself. And so that's exactly what he does. He flees to Haran to find a wife, and he ends up working for 20 years, where he ends up with uh, about four wives. <laughs> and funny how that worked out, and it's the one who is supplanting and scheming, he's the one being taken advantage of all of a sudden. And so after 20 years, he's about to go back to the land of Canaan. Obviously, he hasn't seen his brother in 20 years, and he's there's still that nagging question in his mind, is Esau still angry with me? Does Esau want to kill me still? And so as he's preparing to return to eat to Canaan, he sends these train 
kinds of gifts before him to Esau and kind of hoping to appease him a little bit so that way, you know, when he meets, he's not coming with a dagger, but maybe with open arms. And so that's uh, the part that we read at the beginning of Genesis chapter 32. But in verse 24, we're led to this interesting encounter here. It says, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, he touched the socket of his thigh, and the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated while he wrestled with him. And then he said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, you shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and prevailed. And then Jacob asked him to tell, and said, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob named the place Peniel, for he said, I have seen God face to face, yet I have been preserved. And when the sun rose upon him, just as he crossed over Penuel, he went as he was limping on his thigh. Therefore, to this day, the sons of Israel... Do not eat the sinew of the hip, which is on the socket of the thigh, because he touched the socket of Jacob's thigh and the sinew of the hip. So, we find Jacob here. It says in verse 22, he crosses the ford of Jabbok, and I'm not sure what kind of, how successful that dealership was, but he crosses over the ford of Jabbok, and he finds himself there wrestling with this man. And the man is identified here, or it doesn't tell us anything about the man here, but it says something about uh, them wrestling together. On the surface, it appears that there's kind of an even match. I don't know about y'all, but I'm not going to wrestle all night long. I'm sorry, I, I don't think I have that kind of energy to go all night long wrestling. But Jacob and this man wrestle, and they wrestle all night long, and it says that when the man sees that he's not prevailing against Jacob, he touches the, the, the socket of his thigh or his hip, and it's dislocated. That seems like they're fairly uh, even against one, one another, but it, when you read that detail, it kind of seems that maybe it wasn't so, uh, so evenly matched to begin with. And you think about wrestling with little kids. I remember we was at dinner tonight and, and saw those pictures of Kyler when he was just a little thing. I remember him when he's that young. And you could wrestle with him when he's that little. I wouldn't do that now because he'd break me like a twig. And I remember when he's that little. You could wrestle with him and you know you kind of let kids act like they're winning and, and all that. But then when you're done, you can just pick them up and toss them over on the couch. You act like they're evenly matched, but in reality they're not. They're way overmatched, but you're being generous to them, or you're being gentle with them. I think that's kind of a, a, a way that we see that with Jacob here. He's overmatched from the beginning, and yet this man is allowing him to strive with him throughout the night. And then when, when the morning comes, he just touches the socket of his hip and is dislocated. I don't know about y'all, but I can't do that. And yet Jacob's hip is dislocated, and so... The man asks Jacob to let him go, but it says Jacob would not. And he says, let me go for the dawn's breaking. I will not let you go unless you bless me. That kind of sounds like Jacob is, is a little demanding there, doesn't it? You've got to bless me first. I, I'm not going to let you go. You've got to bless me first. Now, I want to pause here for just a second. I want to go over to the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 12. Because in Hosea chapter 12, we get a couple of details here about this story that fills in the kind of some of the details here. Hosea chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, talking about Jacob, it says, In the womb he took his brother by the heel, and in his maturity he contended with God. Yes, he wrestled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and sought his favor. He found him at Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Now, the first thing that I think we can notice here is that this is an angel that is identified that Jacob wrestled with. It's not an ordinary man, but it's an angel. And, of course, it says he strives with God. And so however, however you want to work that detail out, that's, I'm going to leave that one to you. But it says he wrestles with an angel and prevails. 
But then it says Jacob wept and sought his favor. When we read there in Genesis, Jacob says, no, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. Here it says he wept and sought favor. So what in Genesis feels like a demand for a, a blessing, here it seems like it's more of a plea for a blessing. A more of a desperate plea of one who has been defeated, who has lost, and is clinging to this blessing. I need your blessing. It is the kind of a way that Hosea would present, present that. In a sense, a kind of admission of defeat. I'm not going to let you go because I need this blessing from you. Do you see a little bit of difference in Jacob here? This is not the Jacob that we've known up to this point. The Jacob who schemes now all of a sudden he finds himself unable to be scheming. He finds himself in desperate need of a blessing from this man. He pleads for a blessing. And so if we go back to Genesis chapter 32, Jacob is asked in verse 27, what is your name? And he says, Jacob. He says, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and have prevailed. Oftentimes throughout the Bible, God or, or people associated with God often ask questions that they already know the answer to. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve sinned, God says, Adam, where are you in the garden? God knew where he was. God knows. And the angel knew who he was wrestling with. And so he's not asking this question as if he doesn't know who Jacob is. But rather, Jacob needs to admit who he is. Jacob is the supplanter. And by doing so, he's admitting not just who he is, but what he's done to his brother. There's all this turmoil that he's experiencing about going to meet his brother. Who are you? I'm Jacob. I'm the supplanter. And the only reason I'm worried about this is because I'm the one who's been scheming and taking advantage of my brother all my life. And so the man says, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel. That's who you were. That's not who you are anymore. That's not who you are anymore. And so I'm sure we're aware that names mean something in the Bible. Jacob's name meant supplanter because that described who he was, but there's a change that takes place in Jacob here. And we see a different Jacob from this point forward. And we see Jacob in the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 where it describes him as a man of faith. When you look at the early part of Jacob's life, you're thinking, how does Jacob end up here? But in the latter part, we see faith from Jacob. But I think there's something interesting here, both in Genesis 32 as well as with Hosea 12. And it both says, both of them say that Jacob has wrestled and yet prevailed. I don't know about y'all, but if I'm wrestling with someone and they touch the socket of my hip and it's dislocated, I don't count that as a victory, do you? Now, how does Jacob prevail here? Well, Jacob gains victory not through winning the wrestling. Because throughout his life, he's relied on himself, on his own scheming, or his own advantages that he claims, gains for himself to claim victory. But through the wrestling, Jacob finds himself crippled here. And now relies, desperately pleads, upon the angel for a blessing. The victory that Jacob gains is not through his own scheming, but it's gained through surrender. And so as we compare these two passages together, Genesis and Hosea, and it talks about J Jacob pleading with the angel for a blessing, he's surrendering himself. 
to God. And he gains victory through surrender. Now this is a case throughout the Bible where we have a very literal wrestling. I want to look at another example of one who was wrestling, but not in a literal sense, but more of a figurative sense. And for that, we're going to go to the book of Job. We're going to consider Job for just a second. Job, I'm sure we're well aware, he was, uh, I don't know how or where or why or what it takes place in the first two chapters there where God and, and Satan are discussing this. Uh, how, the details of that are above my pay grade, but all I know is there's some kind of discussion that goes on here. And, and, and Job, is, Satan basically tells God, you know, if the only reason that Job is faithful to you is because you give him so much, you bless him so abundantly. If you take all of that away, he'll curse you to your face. And God just says, don't hurt him. And so Job loses everything, and yet he refuses to curse God. And then Satan says, you know what, if you took away his health, then he'd curse you. And God says, just don't kill him. And so Job refuses to curse God, but in his grief we find Job wrestling with this situation and struggling to understand why he's found himself where he's at. Job and his friends throughout this book operate from a very basic worldview. And it's rather quite simple. If you are good, then good things are going to happen to you. But if you're evil, then bad things are going to happen to you. And we like to think that that's just the way life works, right? Good things happen to good people. Bad things happen to bad people. But the problem is that's not reality. Because we all know good people who have bad things happen to them. We all know bad, good people who have lived who have had their lives cut short. Or, or good people who have faced all sorts of turmoil in their lives. We also know bad people who have lived long and healthy lives. And so Job's friends throughout this book are telling Job, again, operating from that world where you, Job, this bad thing has happened to you because you've sinned, obviously. You need to repent. That's what God's trying to tell you. And Job's saying, wait, I've done nothing wrong. I've not sinned against the Lord. And I don't know why this is happening to me. He maintains his righteousness and yet questions the bad things that are happening to him. If you look at chapter 7, verse 11. In chapter 7, verse 11, Job begins to express his frustration with the situation he finds himself in. And to be fair to Job, I think some of this may be come from the prodding of his friends. Now, you know how sometimes when you're just constantly being poked by somebody, you eventually just snap? I think that may be a little bit of what's happening to Job here, but in chapter 7, verse 11, it says, Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Job's frustrated. Job's filled with sorrow here. And he doesn't understand why. And later on in chapter 29, we find Job expressing the, the idea that he feels as if God has abandoned him. As if God has turned his back on him. In chapter 29 and verse 2, Job says, Oh, that I were as in months past. As in the days when God watched over me, when my, his lamp shone upon my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, as I was in the prime of my days, when the friendship of God was over my tent, when the Almighty was yet with me. Job's basically saying, I wish I could go back to the time when God was there. When I knew God was with me. Job's distressed. He's frustrated, he's filled with sorrow, and I don't know who wouldn't be. And he starts to wonder, well, where is God? Why did this happen to me? Why did God allow this to happen to me, a righteous man? And so we go through this, this book, and we find Job maintaining his righteousness, and his friends saying, you know what? Job, you're just a sinner. You 
need to repent. Job's like, I'm not, though, and I don't know what's going on. In chapter 38, God's turn to speak comes. And as God begins to speak here, I think it's very easy for us to look, to look at it and think God is just saying, you know what, Job? Look here, you little twerp. You're, you just don't understand, and you need to shut your mouth, and you need to listen to what I have to say. But I don't think that's really what God is saying here. Because if you take close look, a close look at everything God says and you compare it with the rest of the book, he's directly answering things that Job and his friends have said throughout the letter. God is responding to some of the various claims that Job is making to remind him that he's still there, that he's still in control, that he still cares, and that he's still present. And, you know, you thought that I forgot about you. You act like I don't care. But look at these animals over here. Look at how they're taken care of. And if I care for them, don't you think I care for you too? And so Job, and I, I do think there is a, a twinge of, of rebuke here in, in God's response to Job. I've been here all along, and you should have been able to see it. And so we come to chapter 42, where it's Job's turn to respond. And Job realizes that in his distress, he seems to have forgotten God. Not that he's forgotten that God ever existed. As we've already noticed, he said, I wish I could go back to the day when God, God was there. But sometimes those difficulties that we face, the traumas that life can bring, can cause us to not think so clearly, right? And we begin to think things that maybe we shouldn't. And we begin to, to, to say things that maybe we don't really mean, but it's the frustrations of the situation boiling over. And I think that's a little bit of what's happening to Job. Verse 2. Of Job 42, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. And I don't see that as Job saying, look, I, I, wait, 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 I know that you can do all things, but now I know. Not that he didn't know before, but he's reminded once again, that's right. That's right. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand. Job realizes, you know what? I shouldn't have questioned him in the way that I did. Maybe I went a little too far here. Things too wonderful made for me, which I did not know. Hear now and I will speak and I will ask you and you will instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. What we see Job doing here is realizing, recognizing once again, both the goodness and the majesty of God. And as we're going to talk a little bit more on Thursday, when we see the goodness and the majesty of God, when we truly appreciate that, it transforms our life. And so, Job, now my eyes see and repent in dust and ashes. Job realizes that what he needs to do is call prostrate before the Lord. And Job gains victory. In verse 10, Job is restored. The Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord increased all that Job had to fall. Job experienced some terrible, terrible things, but he finds victory at the end. I want to ask how does Job find victory? Just like Jacob, Job finds victory because he surrenders himself before the Lord. I repent in dust and ashes. 
I retract and I repent. In dust and ashes, he sees God. And he sees his own, his, the character of God. And he realizes his own unworthiness. And so he surrenders himself before the Lord. And God blesses him abundantly. Like it's very similar to what you see with Jacob there. You see the same thing with Job. And so what about us? What about us? Throughout our lives, we're going to find times where we wrestle with God as well. The Psalms are filled with that kind of thing. In Psalm 13, in Psalm 13 and verse 1, David asks God, How long, O Lord, will you forgive me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Sounds just like Job, right? I don't know why this is happening. And I've been praying, and I've been praying, and I've been praying, and it seems like it falls on deaf ears. How long are you going to leave me here? Sometimes we wrestle. Just like Job. Just like the psalmists. Sometimes it's a matter of wrestling because it's an inward struggle between our will and God's will. They're kind of button heads here. I'm reminded of somebody who's understood what the scriptures say regarding being remarried. They realize that they were divorced for an unscriptural reason and their, their only option is to remain unmarried. And, and they're trying to search through the scriptures and they're, they're going over it with a fine tooth comb to try and find some kind of loophole in there. Or somebody who knows what the Bible says regarding a particular sin, but they're trying to, to find some way around it. I know what it says about this, that, or the other, but it, does it really mean that? Does God really get so upset about that little thing? And they start twisting definitions, and they start trying to finagle things to fit, to make themselves okay before the Lord. Sometimes that's the way we wrestle. Sometimes grief causes us to wrestle with the question of why. Why did God take my son? Why did God allow this to happen to these good people? Why did this, that, or the other happen? Why did such a tragedy occur? Why does the good God allow that to happen? Why me? We wrestle with those kinds of things. And, and Paul even wrestles with those things. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I think we see an example of that. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is pleaded with God. He says three times for the thorn in the flesh to be removed from him. But he finds victory through surrender. In verse 10. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 10, Therefore... I am well content with weakness, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am made strong. Here's a song, and I'm, I'm assuming it's in this book. But it's called Close to Thee. And one of the verses... It says, not for fame or earthly pleasures, not for something like that. Does my soul desire? Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Do you have that kind of faith? Are you willing to surrender like Paul? Gladly will I toil and suffer, only let me walk with thee. Victory comes. Through surrender. We need to realize that if we hope to gain victory with God, we simply need to surrender ourselves to Him and let God reign in our lives. We're going to find times where we're wrestling with God and we need to realize that there's no virtue in wrestling with God. There's absolutely nothing for us to gain by being at odds with God. 
Now, I think we can see that in Job's situation and, and throughout the scriptures, I think we can see that God is gracious towards it. God understands that we don't know the big picture. And by the way, God never tells Job why. And God realizes that Job doesn't understand it. And so I think there's a bit of graciousness towards that. But we need to realize that there's nothing virtuous in wrestling with God. I need to surrender. That's where the virtue lies. I surrender all. We need to reach that point that our will becomes God's will. Now you can do God's will and it not be your will. You think about a little kid, they're told to go walk and clean their room. They might do it, but they're miserable the whole time. They don't want to clean their room, and they might be angry that they have to be here cleaning their room the whole time. They're doing the will of their parents, but they're not happy about it. We need to reach that point where our will becomes God's will. Where we no longer wrestle with God, but we've surrendered to Him, and we make accomplishing His will and His purposes our greatest desire. And again, that's another part of where the, the gospel is counterintuitive. Victory from a human standpoint comes through asserting oneself and, and establishing one's own, one's own dominance over another or establishing our own will. But in the gospel, it comes through surrender. How many times does Jesus say, I didn't say, I didn't come to be served. And if anybody had the right to be served, it was Jesus. And yet Jesus says, I'm not here to be exalted and lifted up and, and bowed before. But he says, I've come to serve. And if the God of heaven is willing to do that, what more, how much more should I be willing to surrender myself? Victory in the kingdom of God comes through realizing our own unworthiness. And surrendering ourselves to God. And that's the basis of our salvation and of our relationship with God. If you remember in Matthew chapter 5, in the, the Beatitudes, it begins, Blessed are the poor in the spirit. It's not blessed are the proud. It's not blessed are those who are mighty and strong and have plenty to offer. Blessed are those who know they have nothing to offer. You realize your own inability to dig your way out of the hole that you found yourself in. I'm unworthy. All of sin falls short of the glory of God, and I've done. There's nothing I can do to fix that. Absolutely nothing that I can do of myself to be restored back to the fold of God. And so the realization becomes more apparent when we finally see God. And that's the picture there in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees the throne of God and he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I don't belong here. We see ourselves broken, full of sin. And we see the holy God of heaven in whom there is no darkness. And I have nothing to offer. Nearer, still nearer, nothing I bring. Not as an offering to Jesus my King. Only my sinful, now broken heart. Now contrite heart. Give me but Jesus, thy Lord crucified. That realization leads us to be wholly dependent upon the Lord. Surrendering ourselves to Him for the blessings that He's provided. Remember Jacob, he's the supplanter. He's the one who, he takes care of it himself. And when it comes to the blessing that he was, God said from the very beginning before they were born, the younger will serve, the older will serve the younger. And I'm pretty sure that there was a way around to getting that to come to pass without Jacob having to lie to his own father. But Jacob decided to do it his way. 
We depend upon God, not on ourselves. Because as we mentioned yesterday, when we do it our way, we're going to lose every time. We're going to lose every time. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, we find essentially the gospel being described here. Romans 5 and verse 6, while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man. Someone would even dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath of the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And now, not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom we have now received the reconciliation. Notice what Paul says there in those verses. He says we were helpless, ungodly, sinners, objects of the wrath of God and enemies of God. That's who we were. All those things. And yet Paul goes on to say, you know what? But you cleaned up your life. You started living better. And you did a great job. Look how good you've been now. That's not what he says, verse 8. But God. But God. Demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, if I want to gain victory with God, it's not through my own merit, it's through nothing that I can accomplish for myself, but it's by surrendering myself to God and the cleansing that He has provided through Christ Jesus. I think we all have points where we might tend to wrestle with God. For whatever reason, whether it's we like particular sin over here, we're trying to justify it, or, or we just don't understand why God has put us here in this particular situation. We might wrestle with God, and God might allow us some wiggle room there to wrestle. But we always need to remember that He is greater than we are, and His ways are better than ours. While God may give us a little bit of room for wrestling, while He may be a little gracious towards it, never, ever let yourself get to a point where you're irreverent. We need to always remember who God is. That He's greater, and I don't understand it, and I don't have to understand it. I just need to trust Him. And ultimately, we're not going to succeed if we continue to wrestle with God. We'll only gain victory by acknowledging His greatness and by surrendering ourselves to Him. And so like Jacob, as he pleads for this blessing, I'm not going to be the supplanter anymore. I'm not going to be the schemer. I'm not going to try and do it in trying to do it my way anymore. I surrender all. I'm going to do it God's way. <clears throat> so let's learn to do God's will in all that we do. Surrendering to Him so that we may gain and share in His victory. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 at the end, when the Lord returns, he's gonna, the dead in Christ will be will rise, and those who are alive will be caught up with the Lord together to meet to be in the air. And he says, We don't know exactly what we're gonna be like, but we're gonna be changed in the twinkling of an eye. He says, Then we'll be brought to pass the saying, Death is overcome. He says, Oh death, where is your sting? Oh death, where is your victory? He says, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That comes through surrender. We gain that victory. God is victorious at the end. And when we stand with Him and we're on His side, we share in the victory with Him. And so are you wrestling with God right now? Is there some way in which you find you've wrestled with God? Are you 
trying to finagle some way to get your own will in there. Realize God's way is better than yours. Now, I don't know what your way is, but you need to give it up so that God's will can be accomplished. Remember, Jesus says, I do not, I can do nothing of myself. And if Jesus himself says I can do nothing of himself, how much more should we say the same? Or maybe you don't understand why. Whatever circumstance you find yourself in, you're in. Surrender to the Lord. Fall at his feet. We might talk a little bit more about that on Wednesday. When we don't understand why. But if you find that you're wrestling with God, kind of just surrender to him right now. I surrender all. If you need to surrender by being baptized into Christ, by crying out to him for salvation, to I mean, buried with him in baptism and raised up in the newness of life, we'd be happy to help you to do that right now. To become a child of God, to put on Christ, to have your sins washed away, so that you who were once a sinner and an ungodly and an object of the wrath of God and an enemy of God can be reconciled to him. But if you are a child of God and you've wrestled with him and you've turned away from him, time to come home. Time to surrender your will to the Lord so that he can redeem you, he can restore you, and that he can renew you. And if we can pray with you, if we can encourage you or help you in any way in that regard, we'd be glad to do that. But as we study throughout the scriptures, the invitation has been extended to us as a means to draw us to God. It is a means of calling us to come home. God wants us to be reconciled. He wants us to be restored. He wants to bless us. Don't delay any longer. If in any way you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, why not now? As we stand and sing together.